My next assignment is in Anajef, which is located in southern Iraq and about 98 miles from Baghdad. Between Anajef and Baghdad is the city of Hilla. And outside the city of Hilla are the ancient ruins of the city of Babylon. The same Babylon as told in the book of Genesis, chapter 11, verse 3. When the people moved eastward, they found a plain in Shinar. They said, Come, let's build ourselves a city and tow with its top to the heaven. The chief of the private security company assigned to escort me to Anajef says I stand out too much. I'm too tall and too white. So he gives me a brand new kafia he bought at the local souk for a couple dinars. He takes off his kafia and gives me a wrap by wrap instructions on how to fold it so it looks authentic. Not exactly T.E. Lawrence from the movie Lawrence of Arabia, but close enough. Not actually the look I was going for, I rewrap the kafia. We arrive at Camp Babylon and the area is heavily defended and pictures of the perimeter defenses are not allowed. I am told this sector is led by the Polish military, which has special forces in the famous Chemical Warfare Regiment of Bratica. Just outside the camp is an Iraq maintenance shop which specializes in gunsmithing. This is good news to the mercs, as several of them have weapons that need parts and fixing. The security chiefs ask me if I know how to handle an AK-47. I say yes, and he hands me one. He tells me to blend in and stay close to the mercs, as this sector is still hot. One of the guys that scouted the area comes back and says the Babylon Museum is open and points to a blue building. For those of us not here to get our guns worked on, there's not much else to do, so we head on over to the museum. We walk into a small lobby and are greeted by a woman. I am shocked and curious, as this is the first Iraq woman I've seen in person. After paying our one dollar, we walk over to a big map of Iraq on the wall. The map is illustrated with antiquity sites located all around Iraq. The other important and major sites are Samara, which I just came from, and Najef, which I am going to. Another map on the opposite wall is of the ancient city of Babylon. Naively, I am here to see the tower, unbeknownst as to the wonders I am about to learn. We walk into the main entrance courtyard and are a bit surprised to see British soldiers there. My attention is drawn to paintings in the stone reliefs and quickly see they are not authentic and quickly move through several corridors and doors until I get to this sign and realize I am on Procession Street, the grand entrance to the fabled city of Babylon. Procession Way is the main entrance into the walled city of Babylon and was built around 575 BC by Nebuchadnezzar II. The way which leads to the Ishtar Gate is located on the north side of the city. During New Year's celebrations, statues of deities were paraded through the Ishtar Gate and down Procession Way. My guide points to one of the several restored buildings that flank Procession Way and points out a dragon relief imprinted in the brick, the mythical dragon of Marduk, the top god of Babylon, with its scaly body, serpent's head, viper's horn, front feline paws, hind bird claws, and scorpion's tail was sacred to the god Marduk. The gate that I see in the distance is a replica built over the original. A model reconstruction of the gate is thought to look something like this. A reconstruction of the gate using materials excavated by Robert Coldaway is on exhibit in the Peregrine Museum in Berlin, Germany. The excavation ran from 1902 to 1914 and 45 feet of the gate's foundation were uncovered. The gate is constructed of glazed brick with alternating rows of bas reliefs of dragons and oryx, a domesticated and now extinct cattle. When I think of Babylon, there is only one thing that comes to mind, and that is the biblical and famed Tower of Babylon. My imagination goes wild with the possible size and height of the tower, which according to Genesis reached into the heavens. The reality is Samarians built towers called ziggurat throughout their empire, 
The largest and only surviving one is the great ziggurat of Ur, built around 2100 BC by King Ur-Namu. The Shoyun Collection in Oslo, Norway, houses the largest private manuscript collection in the world, 13,000 all said. And in that collection, researchers found written on a steel, which is a big stone tablet, the actual dimensions of the tower, which in today's measurements are 91 meters or 300 feet high, and was constructed in steps, as his drawing shows, and may have looked something like this when fully constructed. We continue our guided tour down Procession Way and walk into the forted city. The sign says we are in the southern palace of Nebuchadnezzar II, which is 52,000 square meters and was used until the 2nd century BC. This is the Great Hall of Nebuchadnezzar II. In 1983, Saddam Hussein started rebuilding the city on top of the old ruins, destroying artifacts in the process. I looked at the reconstructed walls and it saddened me that very little of the original city is left. I want to see the real ruins of Babylon and started looking outside the reconstructed fake. I want to see what Robert Caldwell saw when he started his excavations in 1899. I leave the building and go outside the museum grounds, walking along a service road towards an area surrounded by barbed wire. What I find is Saddam Hussein's palace on a hill called Saddam Hill, overlooking the ruins. It was built after the first Gulf War. I walk around the palace on the hill and find a mud clay wall. I have found the ruins of Babylon. The first reported archaeological excavation of Babylon were conducted in 1811 by Claudius Rich, then in 1827 by Robert Mignum, in 1849 by William Loftus, in 1850 by Austin Layard, in 1852 by Flugens Fresnel and Julius Opert, whose boat of 40 crates of artifacts sang in the Tigris, in 1854 by Henry Rawlins, in 1879 by Hormuz Rossum on the behalf of the British Museum, which caused major damage to the site. But it wasn't until 1899 when Robert Caldwell conducted the first scientific archaeological excavation, discovering Ekamaneki, a.k.a. the Tower of Babylon, and the Ishtar Gate. This is all that remains of Babylon, as the fire and glazed bricks of the outer wall were looted by the Assyrians, the Persians, and the Arabs. Most structures were made of adobe, a mud, sand, and straw mix which is very strong and durable. Further down, I see more of the fortified outer wall. The wall encircled the city and provided some protections against marauding bands. The walls are approximately 50 feet high and remarkably still in good shape, having weathered 2,500 years. The resiliency of the adobe brick is apparent when standing next to them, as each brick can be seen individually. There are more ruins further down, and I desperately want to explore them, but I am told they could be booby-trapped, especially the abandoned houses filled with litter and debris. When Nebuchadnezzar II built the Tower of Babylon, he inscribed his name in the bricks, which were carefully erased by conquering rulers who never inserted their own names. In 1983, Saddam started to rebuild the city and inserted his name in many of the bricks. This was built by Saddam Hussein, son of Nebuchadnezzar, to glorify Iraq. We are done with our tour of Babylon and head back to the trucks, where we meet up with the chief of security and wait our turn in line to be fueled up. As all the mercs know, never sit in a vehicle while it's being fueled up. We get back on the road leaving the main highway and getting on a dirt road crossing a dam stretching the Tigris and finally get to Najef two hours later. When we arrive at the base's command post, we notice all the doors are locked and no one is around. A bit surprised, we find the hooches and look for people, all empty. Now we're getting concerned as their weapons were left behind. We draw our weapons and find the mess hall and it's also empty. Something's not right. We find a pot full of food still hot to the touch. I don't have a good feeling about this. 
We exit through the back of the mess hall and find everyone crowded around an SUV. The special forces guys had just raided and hauled back an insurgent's weapons cache, and everyone was excited about the vintage Russian Dragunov sniper rifle with an authentic PSO-1 scope. We all took turns doing the stereotypical poses with the captured booty, including me. At dinner, I meet the other members of the coalition, these being the Poles from the Chemical Warfare Regiment of Brodica. I meet a Nicaraguan soldier and I notice a photo of his family hanging from his chest. He tells me I'm a good man for helping them out and asks if I want to marry his sister, the one in the short black dress. The mess hall is too small and lonely for eating so we stand in line outside while it drizzles. The food looks oddly like Tex-Mex and then I realize the Nicaraguans cooked it up. I'm looking around for tortillas. While I'm standing around waiting to fill up my plate, a soldier comes by and showing off a spiny-tailed lizard he'd caught running around. After dinner, I help carry out the trash to the dump, where we douse it with gasoline and set it on fire. We walk towards camp, and I look back. It's an eerie sight, the barbed wire silhouetted against the orange glow of the fire. <laughs>